We also have like children who are diagnosed with cancers. And so what do we do for that? I know you all see that oh, commercial for St. Jude's. We can't give them, you know, IVF medication, injectable hormones, or freeze their eggs because you can't do IVF or egg freezing until you've had a period. So mm -hmm. what we do now, there it used to be considered experimental, but now you could take a like a girl who's seven years old or ten, and you can actually take a little piece of the ovary cortex on one side. You cut them up in little strips, and you freeze those ovarian cortex strips for her. When she becomes of age, like 15, 17, you can implant that back into her abdomen. She'll respond. She'll grow her own eggs and get estrogen. She can actually then freeze eggs if she wants to because it will burn out at some point. But it's a way to give children who are pre pubertal a chance to also have their families. Welcome back to another episode of the Doctors and Dollars podcast. As always, I'm your host, Nate Cranell. I am joined today by Dr. Erica Loudon. Dr. Loudon is a highly skilled scientist and reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist, focusing on all areas of reproductive health. Dr. Loudon's research efforts focus on access to care for cancer and infertile patients. In addition, she's authored articles for several medical journals and textbooks, clinical studies, and has had her research covered and peer-reviewed publications. Very cool. Welcome to the show, Dr. Loudon. Thank you for having me. You bet. What's going well today? Oh, it's uh, another day in the neighborhood, right, Dr. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, anything exciting? Go I mean, we're in the middle of the week right now. Anything exciting going on this week? Oh, yeah, it's always exciting. Uh, I think every day... You have the good and the bad. When I say the good, those are the highlights. It kind of outshadows the bad, but it's always opportunity. I feel like uh, what I do kind of just helps bring hopes. People get one step closer to like their dreams. So I think that's great. And so that makes the day better, those wins. Yeah. I think, um, luckily for me, most days I have a win with patients. Some days we're like, okay, we didn't get the results. What do we do next? For sure. Which, yeah, I have a question about that here in a little bit, because I, I got to imagine the uh, the fulfillment and the satisfaction that can come with even one win a day. You might there might be days you get five wins. Right. But oh, yeah. uh, even getting one. one win a day has to feel fantastic. It does. Um, it feels great when patients are satisfied. They're getting their their pregnancies. They're going through their treatment. They have a plan even before they get there, even the excitement that they feel because, you know, they sometimes they've been trying for five years and they didn't think it was going to happen, even when they're just getting ready for treatment. A lot of times because the patients wanted to be pregnant yesterday, they're so anxious. So it's kind of dealing with that anxiety, but also the excitement that comes with it makes it good. Yeah. Well, let's, let's dive right into it. Um, on that same topic, how long, what, what's kind of the average, like when when people come to you, like how long are they waiting? Do they try for five years? Like, is that the common? Is it, you know there's women, there's women who have tried for five months and they're like, eh, we're just, we just can't get a crack at it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want you to wait five years. So the definition of infertility is based off of age. So the oh. American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is our guiding body requires that if you have, are less than 35, you have to have been trying for 12 months and have not conceived. If you're yeah. over 35, Six months of uh, trying to conceive and not having a successful pregnancy gives you a diagnosis of infertility. And that is when we want you to see a provider to get a workup to see what the potential causes are that we can mitigate to get you to a pregnancy. There are some caveats uh, where you don't even need to wait those time periods. Like if you know you have irregular cycles, if you know you have something called endometriosis, then you don't need to wait those time periods at all. You just come if you know you've been trying and we can assist you with like getting um, closer to like treatments that can help you get your practices. Um, and with that being said, we're talking about in this case, heterosexual couples, but we also work with people who you have infertility because you just don't have the, the components of egg and sperm in the uterus. So same sex sure. male, same sex females, we do assist them as well. And obviously there's no time frame in that matter because you know, you can't get pregnant with, without all components. Um, another aspect that many people don't know, with reproductive endocrinologists is, is also patients who are getting pregnant. 
Patients who have recurrent miscarriages also need to see a, a reproductive endocrinologist because when you're having more than two uh, pregnancy losses, that is when you need to get a workup to see why these miscarriages are happening and we can assist with making sure that we can get a healthy pregnancy that continues going forward. Yeah. Is there guidelines there um, similar to, hey, if you're over 35, 12 months designates it as infertility, is there a certain number of miscarriages then that you, you would fall into that same uh, yes. Category. Yeah. So like uh, over 35 is waiting six months, not 12 months. Um, but for as far as recurrent pregnancy loss, when you're dealing with reproductive endocrinologists, it's two losses. Uh, if you've had two miscarriages, that increases your odds that you're going to have a third. So that's when we want to do a workup. However, if you're talking to your OBGYN, who we're all OBGYNs if we're REIs, but we do a special fellowship to get more especially trained, they may tell you, uh, for their guidelines, they want to wait till you have three losses, but you do not need to wait three losses. So it kind of depends on what pr practitioner you're talking to. But yes, two at a minimum is the loss that you want to start the work up. For sure. But I got to imagine there's going to be couples out there who maybe have had one or two kids already. And then that third one, they lose. And so they may come to an endocrinologist right away to be like, hey, what's going on here? Like we're, right. we're usually kosher here. Yeah. Yes, yes, because when you've had children already and now it's becoming difficult, that's called secondary infertility. So we know if you've been able to get pregnant in the past, why is it harder? It can be things as simple as endocrine, your hormones. Is your thyroid functioning appropriately? What about your prolactin? How's um, you know your uterus, like after having deliveries in the past, if you've had a C-section in particular, you can have scar tissue. These are there, so there's causes endocrine and pathophysiologically with the anatomy that can be different after previous pregnancies that can now be causing you to have difficulties in getting pregnant or staying pregnant. Yeah, is, is that more common than uncommon to to have multiple children and then have a miscarriage later, or is it uncommon in that usually miscarriages happen first and then everything starts mm -hmm. to work as normal? It's a mixture. Uh, if I had to like look at the data to see what's more common, I feel like secondary infertility is more uh, common where you've gotten pregnant and now you're having difficulties. And it's not actually a factor of age because as we get older, things don't work as perfectly as um, they were. So if you had a baby at 30 or in your 20s, but now you're looking at 39 or 40, uh, miscarriages happen at a higher rate later in life. Infertility happens at a higher rate later in life than it does early. So if I had to say that and look at the data, it's more common to have problems later in life than to happen it earlier. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I mean, hormones are changing, uh, your body changes, your diet changes. All, a lot of the factors that you mentioned just naturally kind of happen as you as you creep up on 40. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's that's the answer I expected. But uh, hey, we're here to ask the experts. So yeah, had to yes. ask it. <laughs> there you go. Glad you well, asked. <laughs> you bet. Well, I, I like to start the episodes, like, let's go back to the beginning of your medical career. So I know that um, you did your medical schooling and your residency at Wayne State, um, mm -hmm. focusing on OBGYN. Then you did your fellowship, uh, I believe it was at Augusta, right? You did in, in REI. Yes. Um, was, there, was there a specific like moment or event in time, like after you completed medical school, where you just knew you wanted to go down the OBGYN and infertility path? Okay. Well, let me just throw the monkey wrench in here. Well, I'm older than I look. Thank you. Oh, um, <laughs> so I actually, <laughs> I'm only saying this because I went to medical school knowing I was going to do OBG and I went in already with a plan. This is not a nice. surprise that I ended up here. I plan to be here. Um, Perfect. And when I say that, it usually doesn't happen for people like that. Like you do four years of med school. When you're in med school, you do clinical rotations in different departments or specialties, and then you declare a residency and you apply for a residency. Um, I already knew when I went to med school, I wanted to do OBGYN because before this career, I was a scientist. And so I worked with a reproductive endocrinologist named Dr. Kelly Moley at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And we were studying poor pregnancy outcomes in mice. And so I'm getting bit by mice, but I will sometimes go to clinic with her. And I was really fascinated by um, kind of the, the science behind, you know, if you believe in God, this is why I was like, it was so unfair. Men can have babies until the day they leave the earth because you are making new sperm every three months until mm -hmm. unless something's really you know, going on with your health. Women, we have a real clock. You're born with women are born with all the eggs they're ever going to have by the time. 
They get at certain age, the qualities are bad. Even if you have eggs in your 40s, they're not as good as the ones as we mentioned in your 20s and your 30s. So we were looking at those aspects. And so I approached her and was like, I want to go to med school. And she encouraged it. I went to med school with a plan of doing OBGYN because I wanted to do REI and I wanted to, you know, help circumvent kind of mother nature things that are in place. No, we can't prevent that naturopathic physiology of like aging of our ovarian health. But you can also incorporate medicine and help people get their dreams to come true, even at a later age. And so I went in to answer your question, knowing what I was going to do. So that was a surprise versus most people might not know what they want to do till after they've seen the different paths. Sure. Unless it was, uh, I mean, I've had a few guests on that were like, I knew I was going to be a, a foot doctor because my dad and my grandpa were foot doctors, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I've, yeah. I've seen kind of the generational or. Uh, you know, my mom ran a, a family medicine practice for 30 years in our hometown. And, you know, I just love all the different aspects of it. So right. I've seen some of that, but to, to go in, so it was almost, so now I think my question should be, uh, what got you working as a scientist in this field first at, before mm-hmm. going to medical school? Like what got you interested in, in women's health and, uh, and all that? Well, this is when I say uh, the quote, you know, God laughs at your plans, right? So I p- didn't plan to be a scientist. It kind of happened to me. <laughs> Life happened to me. And when I say that, when I was in um, an undergrad, I was working with, uh, I did really well. I was a sci- I like science in general. So one of my professors approached me to work in her lab as a lab technician for the summer. And from there, I started doing research, um, got into programs that the National Institute of Health um, offer because they actually were encouraging minorities to pursue uh, careers in research. And actually, NIH paid for my PhD. So I did my PhD nice. for free. And that's how I got into like science. And when I did the science, I always in the back of my mind thought, okay, yes, I like this, but I do love um, women's health. I might want to do OBGYN. And it's really funny because when I tell people the story that before even science, how did I know I wanted to do um, medicine potentially or women's health? It goes back to a TV show called The Cosby's, which is kind of taboo to say nowadays. But uh, <laughs> Bill Cosby was an OBGYN. He was an OB. Yeah, right as you said, The Cosby, he was an OB. He had a little, uh, he had a clinic in his basement, didn't he? Or a, uh, Exactly. Brought... And, yeah, yeah. And so occasionally they would show those kind of patients, right? But, you know, it was for me, and I think I probably had it on my Instagram because I know you checked me out, um, mm-hmm. you know, it was the first time seeing somebody, uh, a minority person who had like a successful career. Like he was an OBGYN, his wife was a lawyer. And so that kind of planted, I think, the early seeds, uh, even before I kind of pursued science and met Dr. Moley. Oh, that's uh, that's a great story. Um, <laughs> and, and just to see that representation, right? Probably is a, I think we're, bo- we're both 90s babies. And so uh, mm-hmm. to, to grow up in the 90s, you know, in your, in your formidable years and then to see that. Um, yes. I could see how that can certainly shape. I mean, and even they were in Chicago, if I remember right. And no, they were in New York. Great. Was it New York? Almost. New York is almost as great oh. as Chicago, but no. <laughs> almost as great. I would <laughs> say Chicago is better than New York. New York. Hear that, but yes. <laughs> yeah. That's good. So, I mean, you're already interested in science, went down that path, went down the OBG and, and infertility path, then through medical school, all the way through fellowship. Uh, is it the... Is it the patient care? Is it the the wins, like having that daily win that that really drives you each day? Um, it's not the daily wins necessary, but the, I feel like for me, what I like the most is the challenge. So the wins Ooh. are great, right? But uh, if I had to do something that wasn't challenging, I probably wouldn't stick with it. So I, it is challenging because you can't always help everyone but you try and you figure out innovative ways that may not be standard of care. When I say that, for example, there's a lot of things we do in the infertility. We're like reproductive endocrinology. This field is the youngest specialty in America. So our oh, oldest wow. IVF baby is only 40, I think 47. And so no this way. has not been around that long. Oh. And so we're finding new things all the time. So like the research in this area is still ongoing. We're still figuring out like, okay, I have a patient she has diminished ovarian reserve, meaning she doesn't have a lot of eggs, but she wants a baby. What are some things that we could do to help with the quality of those eggs? There's things like IV infusions that patients do with glutathione. They do acupuncture because we see studies may show that they may help with egg quality. So you're doing a, you're putting together a protocol 
and a plan to help your patient get somewhere close to that. Without it, they won't have that opportunity. So for me, I think I like the challenges and of course the wins that come with the challenges because nobody likes to lose. Um, <laughs> nobody likes to lose. Nobody likes to lose. <laughs> yes. What, what do you think is, is the biggest challenge? And what I mean by that is like in your day to day, there's probably times that you're doing a lot of patient care, right? Actual IVF treatments, egg capture, things like that. But then there's also a lot of time where you're probably sitting down with hopeful future mothers uh, and just talking to them about the process. Like which one is more challenging? Which one do you get the most, get the most wins out of? Um, the most challenging is kind of when you have exhausted opportunities with your own natural fertility. Yeah. Um, that is the most challenging because it doesn't mean you still can't have children, but then we we'll have to break broach the conversation of non-traditional ways. Like, have you considered using donor eggs, donor sperm? You even can adopt embryos and carry a pregnancy. But of course, everybody wants their own biological their, yeah, their child. Yeah. Their child. And it's trying, you know, it's kind to educate patients and changing or not changing the mindset, but giving them different perspective. What is your definition of the parent? Do you just want to raise a child? Because people adopt children who are already here and their parents. Um, mm -hmm. When you do donor tissue, like egg, sperm, or embryos, like for example, you, it's usually your husband's sperm. It might be your uh, different woman's eggs, but if that woman still carries that embryo, that child, she still, her blood goes through, she still has to give birth. That's to your child. child. And so we do have to then, if a patient may be interested after you broach those conversations, you know, we want you to talk to a therapist because it's not a traditional way to build your family. Because some people think they can't love a child if it's not theirs, but that's not always true. But obviously you have to have those hard conversations. I think for me, that's the challenging part. You get patients who you can't help with their own fertility, but showing them a different way. And will they accept that? Are they able to accept that? That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Go Talk ahead. to me about what those what those conversations are like. If there is one where it's like, hey, the, the natural way, you, you've kind of exhausted all the options from a natural standpoint. How do you kind of breach that that wall of, okay, we're, we're not done here. Like, I, I get that it, we're upset, but like, there are other options and X, Y, Z are options for you. What are some of those conversations like um, from the patient side of things? From the patient side? I'm not the patient. I can't say from the <laughs> Well, okay, the, re the response is you've breached that wall and, and you know, What's extend the those opportunities out there. What are typical responses that you're getting? Typical responses are usually a no. Like, no, if I have to, if I can't use my own tissue, I don't want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And I have patients who say that and then they go away and then they come back like a year later. Um, mm -hmm. And then they're ready, you know? So they're in that, initially they weren't ready, they weren't in, in what we call the pre-contemplating stage. So I kind of gave them something where they were handled and they went away and thought about it, came back. Uh, some people say no completely and never come back. Then others like, you know, I understand. I just want to get at least one attempt, Dr. Loudon, with my own ex. And we do, I do allow that. And when I say that one attempt, what we mean is, for example, the case is like most clinics will have a age cutoff in which you can use your own biological tissue. For example, in my clinic is 47. Other clinics is as low as 42. Why are those set in place? Because at some point, yes, you have eggs at 45, 47, but the quality of those eggs are not good. So you have, it takes 90 eggs at 45 to find one normal embryo. You don't have 90 eggs. And so at some point it's futile treatment for me to just take your money. Cause I'll take your money if you want to do it, but I have to counsel you that your chances are less than 5%, less than 1%. Yes, you can do a cycle, but the ability to find a healthy embryo with your own Biologic tissue now may take you like too many cycles, meaning you could do 30 cycles and not get a pregnancy from it. Would you want to do that versus would you want this? I can give you a donor egg and you have a 75% to 100% chance of having a baby versus that 5% or less than 1% chance. And so usually when you break down statistics, people kind of understand numbers a little bit. Um, but some patients still, as long as you don't say 0%, they still want to try it. Um, and I'm saying all this to say, even though we have an age cutoff, a lot of times we'll give patients what's called a closure cycle. Okay, I told you the numbers. You still have to have a wrapped your mind around it. Let's For attempt sure. one cycle of treatment. Let's see what happened. At the end of the day, you have no regrets because you did get a chance to try. You got to see what the outcomes would be. And then if if we did not get an embryo, then the patients would say, yes, let's, let's do donor. Yeah. 
because you mentioned 30, like you may go through 30 cycles and nothing like that is 30 heartaches. That's somebody right? who's like in their, like, you know, they're not just do that as a while. Sure. But I do know people who have done 20 cycles, 16 cycles. And these are women who are older, who are, don't have, they have low ovarian reserve or diminished ovarian reserve. Yeah. Um, and when I say those terms, that means somebody who's over 40, who has less than seven eggs, they're in what's a, somewhat like a perimenopausal transition, which, you know, unfortunately, average age of America's uh, menopause is 51. Women don't wake up overnight and hit menopause. There's actually a transition happening. It starts in your 40s. And some mm -hmm. women, unfortunately, it can happen less than 40. And we find those cases occasionally. But I mean, even I know you just threw 30 out there, but like you're talking a year and a half. I mean, so somebody from a year and a half to two years of People, heartaches yeah. every, every, every month where it's just like, uh, so I, I, yeah, I okay. really appreciate you giving them kind of that, that closure cycle. Like let's, let's let this be the last one. And then yeah. let's discuss the alternatives after this, because then mm -hmm. I, I feel like then that last heartache is like, okay, Dr. Loudon, yeah. let's, let's explore our options. I think that's really good. It is. And then I don't want to think, want you to think that those women don't get embryos. They actually do. The problem is they're abnormal embryos, meaning mm. they have extra missing chromosomes because that's the problem as we age. Your eggs fertilize, but they start to pull extra missing chromosomes. You have higher rates of children with like Down syndrome. And I say Down syndrome because most people understand they've seen children who have Down syndrome, but there's others that are not compatible with life. So we don't allow you to transfer those abnormal embryos because either you miscarry, you don't get pregnant, or you find out at 10 weeks of pregnancy, your baby's not healthy. And you have to make that decision. And would you keep that pregnancy or would you terminate? And right now in our current state of affairs in government and politics, you may not have a choice of whether you could keep that child if it's not going to have. So then you might be um, forced to carry a pregnancy to nine months knowing your child's going to live not live after birth. So mm -hmm. that is kind of why it's like very a very hard place to be. And that's a really good point um, because a lot of people have to make those decisions and that's tough depending on yeah the political environment that you live in, the state that you live in. There's, there's a lot of factors there. Is that chromosomal transfer that, that's happening kind of later, can that also lead to more miscarriages as well? Yes. And that's why you see what we see at 40 and above, uh, higher rates of infertility not being able to get pregnant. And then when they do get pregnant, higher rates of miscarriages. Gotcha. That totally makes sense. Uh, I mean, we've talked before about like the education side of infertility. That's, that's a big piece, right? There's, there's kind of the patient care side, but then there's also the patient education side, um, teaching all of those folks who are struggling with getting pregnant, like the, what, the, how, the why type of thing, kind of like what we've been talking about. What do you love most about providing those insights to people? Uh, I do like the education portion of it. Um, uh, one of the things that we do to kind of help patients understand it is like you actually, when patients get on consult with me, they kind of have a class because I show a PowerPoint because, you know, people understand visuals. Like I can throw words at you, but until you kind of see a graph or you see something, maybe it doesn't click depending on what type of learner you are. So I, I think for me, that is one of the aspects I like is the patient education portion of it um, and making sure that patients do feel like they're heard. So what that means is kind of spending a little bit of time with them instead of just kind of rushing things because this is very TLC um, patient care. It's not like you're just going to, you know, internal medicine for your annual physical. This is something that has been bothering you for some people. We hope you wait only a year, but some people have been trying seven years, 10 years, and I don't know why they wait that late. I do know why. Money. Because this is not mm -hmm. free in every state or covered by insurance. And so people are waiting and then they wait. But you, as you're waiting, things get worse. Um, so I like and the you patient age. Education. Yeah, you get age. <laughs> yeah. So I do like the patient education about it. I do like patients who present before they even try. Like I have patient today who she's like, I'm getting married in October, but I want to check my fertility. We love those patients. Check your fertility. Know where you are. You don't want to get you don't want to get pregnant now. You know you're going to be waiting until like two years after marriage. You can check your fertility. You can do something called fertility preservation. You can freeze eggs. You can freeze sperm, and you don't have infertility. This is just something you're being proactive about, which is kind of what we're trying to get more people aware that you can do those kind of things as well. Very interesting. I, I mean, you mentioned uh, social media earlier and Instagram. Uh, you provide a ton of great info on on your social media platforms you know, about reproductive health, about infertility, 
you get asked a ton of questions about specific tests and you provide statistics and data and things like that. I think it's fantastic. Do you see a lot of, um, a lot of women coming into your clinic that are pretty well educated around a lot of this already? You know, they've, they've done a lot of research on the internet. Maybe they've followed your page on Instagram and they've, they've just learned a lot of this and they're coming in not fully prepared, but pretty well prepared and understanding of what's going on. I feel like it's a probably about, yes, with the popularity of social media and Facebook, because there's actually Facebook groups where people just, they share their stories. So I feel mm -hmm. like people are coming in educated. Some of those are misinformation, but they are coming in with more knowledge than we have seen in the past. And that's kind of your job to tell, just dismissify the myths, like, I think the hardest part is like, don't compare your story to somebody else's because their diagnosis of infertility may be for a different reason than yours completely. And that's that's kind of the only problem I find with educating yourself through social media. But otherwise, uh, social media platforms have been good because patients do have some understanding, a little bit basics. And so then we can fill in those gaps. Nice. You, you, you created the perfect segue into my next question that I was going to ask. So of the misinformation, uh, that people have. And, and, you know, there's the myths, like you said, kind of demystifying the myths that are out there because people, you know, the old wives tales and things like that. Mm. What do you think is the biggest piece of misinformation that you see most often, you know, as people come in they're like, well, I heard this, or I know that it's this. And you're just like, mm, that's just not true. Oh, it's me. It's not my partner. I think that's it. Cause people don't realize male factor infertility, 30% of the time it could be male factor, your partner and not necessarily you. But then there's also like uh, another 20% that it can be a factor of both of you. So we have patients who they want to come in behind their partner's back and get tested. And they think it's only me. Well, I can tell you about you. And if you come back perfectly normal, it doesn't mean you still don't have something else going on because it takes two. Right. So I think for, for the population, that's probably one of the best, big misnomers like, oh, it's always uh, on the female side. That's not the case, unfortunately. For sure. How much of the work that you do is on the male side of things where males come in and, and there's the, the same testing, you know, testing the sperm and, and understanding maybe, you know, if this is not working between my partner and I, you know, it, it is the male end of things. Um, first of all, men never come in by themselves. Let me say that. Unless they're a same-sex male couple, they're never coming in and initiating the sure. conversation. They usually are dragged in with their partner. <laughs> um, which, discovered. <laughs> which we, we recommend. Like, you want to do your testing all together. So then I can meet with you two together later on. We go through the results of both of you. And it, it's not a blame game. It's just so where, where the issues are, what can we do to fix it? and move on, what is the best treatment option based off of what we found out? That makes the time go back faster. Because remember, patients want to be pregnant yesterday and they're already, you know, how soon can we get to treatment? Well, we got to go through these steps. If you only come in and do your portion and I tell you, and I tell you yours, and then I got to wait another month for you to do your partner's testing, then you're just delaying what you what your goal is. <laughs> yeah, now you're two cycles in and that two one of those could have been a cycle. Yeah. Two cycles in, I hate to say it, two cycles in and angry because a lot of times they're upset, like this process, you're already angry because, you know, life is life. And then you're not, I'm telling you, it's going to take this time. Oh, then let me not add a third component. If you are in a state that has insurance coverage, some of them require authorization. I can't get authorization for your treatment until I have all your data to submit to them and say, okay, this is what the couple presents with and they need infertility treatment. So there's so many little points there. We try to make it as streamlined as possible. So like we have a good state, a team. You have, usually have to have your nurse, you have your financial, and you have me who are kind of working to get you through the whole process fast, as fastly as yeah. we can. So we say it takes about two months from the time you see me, if you bring your partner with you, to when you can actually start treatments. Yeah, and so is the biggest, uh, the biggest roadblock in that situation that you just gave, especially with prior authorization, you know, for insurance things, is the husband is being stubborn. And so it's like, the they both want a baby, but the wife wants to come in. And then, you know, the roadblock then is, is getting the husband or the, the partner, I should say, you know, to come a smart in. man, yeah. he comes in anyway, he you know, wasted wasting time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would come in right away. So yeah. Yes. Give her what she wants. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of the last part of this, this social media thing that I want to talk about, and, and this was a shocking statistic. And I told you before we started recording that I always do research on my, on my guests before they come on so that I get to know them a little bit better. I was looking through your Instagram account. Uh, you had a post back in April 
uh, you talk about maternal mortality risk for black women mm -hmm. versus other ethnicities. And it was three times higher likelihood compared mm -hmm. to white and Hispanic mothers. Could you provide some like insight on on why that is? Because I, I read that and that was a shocking statistic to me. Oh, well, that's a loaded question. That's like considered to be multifactorial. And one okay. just comes back uh, from, we talked about this a little bit, access to care. So traditionally, just like those underserved areas usually don't have great access to care. And when they do, it's not great quality access to care. Uh, number three is um, bias in our healthcare system. There's been plenty of surveys when patients, they looked at like, you know, an ER visit for a minority person going to the ER versus like Hispanic and Caucasian. If an ER, uh, a minority person goes in the ER and complains about pain, it's automatically assumed they're drug seeking because of their class. So there's institutional racism and bias and they're suspected too with that versus somebody else uh, that comes in, they get treated like, oh, let me get an ultrasound, let's do this versus, oh, there's nothing wrong, send them out. And a lot of times it can lead to morbidity and mortality if they really do have, like, I actually have appendicitis. My appendix was about to rupture and you sent me home and tell me to take Tylenol without even doing an exam, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, this, and they found that with that situation. So it's access to care, it's the background, it's institutional racism bias. And then it's also that patient population and minorities in themselves. Because of historical reasons, they don't have a lot of trust in the system. And it comes from things like Tuskegee experiment, for example, where syphilis mm. was tested on um, minority people, patients without their consent and knowledge, and they let the progression of that disease go off so they could see how it would play out. It's the hearing aid Lex, a woman who had cervical cancer, who went to John Hopkins, a great institution in, in the United States, who let her cervical cancer progress so they could see the natural progression. And she ended up dying from that. They collected those cervical cancer cells and then used them for research that were used for decades without her family's knowledge. So because of things like that, those stories, a lot of times patients uh, of minority descent don't trust health care. Like a lot of them wouldn't even get the COVID shot because I don't know what you're injecting me with. You don't know natural core. So yeah, is this um, another I'm going to lot to say that it's not one pinpoint thing, but because of the lack of trust of like uh, healthcare system and our government, uh, that's one aspect. Lack of access to care, and when that care is there, it's usually subpar care. That's another. Um, not listening to patients. So for that reason, the study did show that most of the time, minority doc uh, patients will only feel comfortable if they had a minority doctor. Well, guess what? There's a shortage of minority doctors. I am a unicorn. In REI, there's only 1% of us who are minorities. So if you're looking for a black doctor to do your reproductive, right, you're going to have wow. a hard time finding it unless you're in Chicago or New York or someplace where it might be a higher population of us. And I'm just throwing REI. If you're looking for a black cardiologist, it's even worse. So then that leaves the patient going to see a doctor who may not understand cultural things. For example, sure. I always tell this story when I was a resident in Detroit, Michigan, which doesn't have a lack of black doctors, but... Uh, a patient came in and she had her C-section. After her C-section, um, she was asking about her surgical scar because she put something called shea butter on it to help prevent keloids. Well, she was talking to a non-minority doctor and that doctor was like, thinking she was talking about butter, like what you buy at the grocery store. And so I had to take him aside and explain that's not what that is and this is what it is. So, uh, and I'm not saying you got to understand everything about everybody's culture, but listening and realizing that your patients are not ignorant do, I mean, sure. if you're not understanding what they're asking x another question to get to like what they're trying to explain and what they're needing from you and that is what kind of is lacking and why we're kind of seeing um health disparities be high mortality mort uh, morbidity mortality it was a recent case with uh she was a former cheerleader um for i think was it the dallas cowboys but she was a black woman married to a caucasian man End up having her uh, going into the hospital, water broke. She had chorioaminosis, which is an infection around the baby with the fluids there. She didn't get appropriate care and she ended up dying. And so the study shows it doesn't matter your matter your uh, income or your social economic status, your education, letter, la, um, education status. These women are still dying at a higher rate or having complications after their pregnancies and deliveries than more, uh, anyone else. And, is thought to be for all those lists of things that I kind of rambled off. Yeah. No, so that was a fantastic answer. answer. Actually, no, that was a fantastic <laughs> answer. I mean, that, that gives a lot of clarity uh, that it's not just a singular reason. 
Um, no. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And a lot of them aren't necessarily um, biological. I mean, some are biological, but some of them yes. are uh, yeah. racial, some of them are socioeconomic. Like that's, mm -hmm. that was a very good answer, Erica. I right. And I didn't, I mean, Dimit, you brought up a good point. Some of it is just unfortunately like the years of, you know, it's generational. Your parents have hypertension, diabetes and all these things. Mm -hmm. Those things, obviously you have some genetic component to them and in the minority communities, they tend to eat like that. Why? That food is cheaper in your neighborhood. You see more fast food restaurants. You see corner stores, but no fresh vegetables and fruits at affordable prices. And so that is also linked to it for that reason. Hey, d, d podcast family. I want to take a quick break in this episode to share a little behind the scenes of why the Doctors and Dollars podcast and our Wealth Wednesday series were made and why they're important. We have a number of physicians in our Grand Vision family office, and through conversations with them, we realize there is a huge void in financial education for physicians. We don't have time to personally work with every doctor out there, so the podcast is a way for us to offer a resource where you can learn about physician-focused wealth strategies via Wealth Wednesday, while also learning from other doctors making a splash in the medical community via Doctors and Dollars. Providing value is our top priority, and if there's a specific question or topic that you want to hear about, just reach out to us on any social media platform or go to the Doctors and Dollars website, which is ddpod.com. Also, if you'd like to take your wealth plan to the next level and be a part of a community of money-minded physicians in our family office, we open applications just twice per year. You can explore and get more details about the next application period at grandvision.co. Now, back to the show. Uh, the un the other side of the coin for uh, maternal mortality risk. So uh, I had a guest on recently, Dr. Louis Perfetta, who's a, a pretty well-known ER doctor in Indianapolis. Uh, and I had asked him, like, what's the craziest thing you think you've seen in the ER? Like in his 30 years, I think he said he's seen somewhere around like 60,000 patients in the ER in his career. It's just some crazy big number. So what's the craziest thing you've seen? So he tells me this story. Uh, and I want to I want to see if if there's... If you can kind of give me the the biology behind it, because uh, I, I just moved along in the conversation because I was shocked. But he said that he had a 95 year old woman that came in, very skinny, frail, you know, was was kind of getting near the end, uh, but was compl complaining of stomach pain. They went in, did an X-ray. Uh, Doctor Profeta comes in, looks at the X-ray, and, and sees like a fully formed baby in there. And he's like, "No, this can't be possible. She's 95 years old. No way that she's pregnant." looks at the x-ray again and they figure out it was a stone baby that she probably got pregnant sometime in her late teens early 20s and then you know the baby passed and she never delivered and so she's had this stone baby inside of her for decades what's what's kind of the biology behind that how is that not a maternal mortality like how did she not pass away from something like that yeah, you know i've so heard long? those i think he might have been pulling your leg i need to talk to him give me his number because okay, I, have, I will <laughs> i've heard like similar stories people said these things i don't know the pathophysiology and like how if she got pregnant her 19 and 20 she never saw a doctor in those last 50 60 years that did an exam then a fully right. formed baby you said she was frail and skinny was it, if it's a fully formed baby, it's not, she's not going to be too, like, not showing some kind of bold sure. or something. I don't know. I think it's an old wife tale. I've never seen it. Haven't seen it in a, a medical textbook. If it's impossible, you know, I would say at the end of the day, all things are possible. Uh, but I will have to get back to you on it because I would be stumped because I don't have an answer for that because I haven't yeah. seen it. For sure. What I should ask him is like, did she have kids later? Because I got to imagine if that's in there, that type of mass is in there. She can't have any future kids, correct? Well, she's 95. She, she's not having any future kids. Oh, I mean, like uh, <laughs> if, if this if this did happen, like in her late teens, early in 20s, 20s, like she. Yeah, she's not having any babies after that. No, I have to imagine if she, that happened to her, she had infertility afterwards because the uterus is a muscle and organ. And usually what happens if, if you have a pregnancy like women have miscarriages, sometimes the, the tissue from the pregnancy doesn't come out completely, and that's called an incomplete miscarriage. Well, if that sits there long enough, you will have some problems like an infection because that's decaying tissue. Can it calcify and get stones? It can. I've seen calcifications, but sometimes if it's enough tissue, you'll get an infection. You'll get a dip, they'll get an odor because that's dead tissue. They'll get signs of sepsis like a fever, foul smelling discharge, abdominal pain, 
Uh, and then usually we'll look and see their beta. We'll do an ultrasound. And if we see something there, we do a DNC, which stands for dilation and cure tires, where we go in and we take a, like, a spoon-like instrument and we clean the uterus out because a lot of times after that, you will have a normal period because the uterus didn't clamp down and close off those vessels where the pregnancy had attached. So there's a lot of complications that can happen from it. And so if she has some calcification, it's possible from a pregnancy, but not going to be a fully formed one because that yeah, I mean, is yeah, where you call and she probably baby. couldn't get pregnant after because the uterus will form scar tissue when it has trauma because it has um, stem cells at the basal level that regenerate every month when a woman does, you know, her cycle comes, she stands mm -hmm. one line and then she starts to grow another one for impending implantation. Well, that won't happen if there's any tissue or some scarring there, not effectively. Um, so, yeah, I'll be curious, like. She probably didn't have regular care, obviously, if that was still there for so many yeah, years. For sure. No, that totally makes sense. Thank you for, for clarifying mm -hmm. that for me. Yeah, I didn't talk to him in the ER and tell him that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, awesome. There are some one frequent big... clients, like a lot of patients use ER yeah. as their primary care doctor because they don't have one. So they just go there anytime something's wrong. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, just come in and knowing like I'm, I'm going to get care pretty quick and I don't care who does it. It's just more of a, yeah, I wouldn't say quick. Have you been in the ER before? Never quick. Uh, not since I was a kid, but yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Never go to the ER unless you're really dying. You'll sit yeah. there for like 10 hours. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Uh, one big thing that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, it, it's, it's something that's, it's a growing passion for you, uh, is around infertility when it comes to, to folks who, have in the past or currently are cancer survivors uh, and, and just the correlation between infertility and uh, cancer. What, what sparked that interest in that kind of niche field? Oh, it actually went back to my research day. So when I was um, okay. at Clark Atlanta University, when I was doing my um, graduate work, I was working with uh, Dr. Kegley Ebal. So she was looking at the Jack Stack signal transduction pathway, which people who don't know what that is, is actually linked to leukemia. So we were studying chronic myelomonocytic leukemia in a mouse model. Remember, everything happens in a mouse because they won't let us test humans anymore like that anymore. <laughs> yeah. So we were looking at this pathway and studying how the receptors are turned on and don't turn off appropriately, and that leads to um, aberrant growth, which is aka leukemia. And so that's kind of how I got into, like, obviously the cancer side of things. And when I started looking at infertility, where I learned that actually, you know, a lot of the medications that we use to treat cancers can be, can cause sterility, where, um, you know, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, of course, uterine cancer, leukemias, like even for men, if they have any prostate cancers, Hodgkin's lymphomas, a lot of the medicines can be, they're called acolyting medicines. They're meant to uh, target and treat rapidly fast growing cells because that's what cancer is. Well, you also have rapidly fast growing cells in your body. That's what your sperms are doing. That's where eggs are. Doing. So you get those chemos and then you find out after you've been cured because we got very good at cancer treatment, like 80%, I think is the quote of people diagnosed with cancer are actually surviving now, at least for five years plus. And so yeah. after they got in their remission, they go in and start their families in there. We're finding out that they couldn't get pregnant. So we, uh, Dr. Uh, Terry Woodhall, she started a, a a niche coin said uncle fertility and she was at the uh, Northwestern University in Chicago and it's a consortium of nurses urologists uh, researchers and REIs OBs who came together like how can we make sure that we can advocate for the pre uh, patient so the big drive is now that if you oncologists they're not thinking about a patient's fertility they're thinking of how can I sustain their life and maybe potentially cure them but what we're trying to do is make sure there's an advocate in every office for a cancer patient where the advocate says, yes, you have cancer. Here's something to think about, though. We're going to treat this cancer and try to beat it. But do know that this can affect your fertility. Are you interested in learning how you potentially can do preservation of your fertility so that you still have options for a pregnancy after it? And so if so, the office oncologist kind of connect them with us. We see those patients within 48 hours or less because they don't have time. They might want to put their chemo port in in a week or two. Well, what can we offer them? If they don't have time to do treatment with us, we give them a medicine called Luprolide acetate or Depolupron, and that kind of preserves a woman's fertility. At least they don't get as much exposure to their eggs. And then 
we hope after their treatment, they come back that medicine kind of will have given them some eggs that are going to be usable. Uh, otherwise, we're trying to freeze eggs, freeze embryos for them if they have a partner. Really quickly, we do them a, a cycle with donated medications or very discounted medications. And, and that's due to like Lance Armstrong, who started a program called Live Strong, where if you have cancer, um, fertility meds are given to patients who qualify for that. There are so many pharmaceutical programs like Heartbeat through um, Walgreens, Reunite has something called MDRX, um, Heartbeat and Reunite. Those are some others. So we have ways to get the patients the medicines, get them through quickly, get them their fertility treatments that they need so that when they are in remissions, they can come back and get pregnant with their own biological tissue and not use donor sperm, donor eggs, for example, right? Sure. Um, so my, my passion just came from, I did cancer research. I'm also interested in fertility. How can I use both backgrounds is what I was looking to do. And that was a good niche that's still underutilized, unfortunately. For sure. I mean, there's there's probably a lot of um, a lot of knowledge and education that you can provide to folks because their first thought, I mean, my first thought when we, when we were talking about it was, um, yeah, just going like you get the cancer diagnosis, that is greatly impactful, both physically and psychologically, but like right. most people's first thought isn't like, okay, I know I have to go through a chemo treatment of some kind. That's going to have some, it's going to ravage my body a little bit. I should go free some eggs or my partner should go free sperm. Like just to, just to mm -hmm. know that we've got that in our back pocket. Most people don't think about that if they didn't, and they, they probably wouldn't go through with it if they didn't have an advocate, you know, in their clinic to do that. So I think that's really cool mm -hmm. that that's, that's out there already. And it, it's probably not, prevalent all over the United States. I know you mentioned yeah. one, you know, the big one in Chicago. And so uh, I, I think if that can be all over the United States to where people just know, and again, we're talking people who are in what I would call childbearing years, right? We're not, you know, it's not a 50 year old who's right. getting diagnosed with cancer and, and you're talking about that. Uh, nice. But if there's just a, a guideline or a protocol in place all around the country that says, if someone is in what you would call their child rearing years, and they're diagnosed with cancer, this needs to be, you know, fertility mm -hmm. needs to be brought up and discussed before any type of um, treatment begins on the cancer. Right, right. And even you, like we say fertility is, but we also have like children who are diagnosed with cancers. And so what do we do for that? I know we all see that oh, commercial for St. Jude's. So like we actually can do, we can't give them, you know, IVF medication, injectable hormones and freeze their eggs because you can't do IVF or egg freezing until you've had a period. So mm -hmm. what we do now there, it used to be considered experimental, but now you could take a, like a girl who's seven years old or 10, and you can actually take a little piece of the ovary cortex on one side, you cut them up in little strips and you freeze those ovarian cortex strips for her. When she becomes of age, like 15, 17, you can implant that back into her abdomen. She'll respond. She'll grow her own eggs and get estrogen. She can actually then freeze eggs if she wants to because it will burn out at some point. But it's a way to give children who are prepubertal a chance to also have their families. Um, yeah. Unfortunately for young males who haven't started this spermatogenesis process, that is still experimental. They don't have anything for boys who are young, but they do have something for little girls now. Yeah, but there is, I'm, I'm assuming there's research out there that says, okay, uh, a young boy who's seven gets diagnosed with leukemia, uh, right? I, I live here in Des Moines, Iowa. Iowa has the, uh, University of Iowa has a great cancer uh, hospital out there that's that's pretty well known around the country. Like, let's say a young boy that's seven goes to the University of Iowa, gets treated for leukemia, survives. Is, is there data behind that to say, okay, now that, when that young man is 27, he has very difficult time uh, producing children, or yes. at least producing sperm even. Producing sperm, that is a possibility depending on what the chemo agent, not all chemo agents do it. There's like a top four of them that we know, like you get them, yes, it's gonna fry the tissue, um, mm. for lack of a better word, you might have, uh, destroy sure. the tissue in the cell. So for seven-year-old boys, if they got like cisplatin, for example, Fertility is a wash because we have nothing to do for them at seven. And when they come back, when they are 27 and have a wife, uh, it's a possibility that you might not find sperm. Um, so then we would send them to a urologist who specializes in uh, reproductive health for men. And what they may offer is like something like testicular sperm extraction to go into 
the sperm, the testes take out a little tubule that carries the sperm, see if they can find some baby spermatids and use that for them. Um, that's kind of unfortunately all that may be possible, but there are this great research that's going on to see if we could do something similar to what the girls, young girls are able to do for boys. It's just not sure. there yet. Um, it's approved as far as like the government has allowed it to be done. Uh, and then, you know, we talk a lot about cancer, but there's other things like rheumatological disorders that, for example, if you have lupus and they put you on methotrexate, um, there are other medicines that are chemotaxic or toxic to eggs and sperm. And so rheumatologists also sends patients to us for fertility preservation. So just not cancer, any agent. So your doctor should be able to look at the medicines, know if it has effect on your fertility health and counsel you, okay, here's what, these are options. You may not be thinking about children, but here's a possibility. Do talk to this person and see if you want to do this. And if not, at least you were counseled and you know the chances after your treatments. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes back to uh, what you said earlier in our conversation where, you know, IVF and, and, and fertility, I guess, in general, uh, the whole REI program is is relatively new. I think you said 47 years. Yes. Um, is the So it's like a lot of doctors who are outside of that REI space who are then prescribing, you know, a, a treatment of some sort, their first thought may not be like, how is this going to impact, um, you know, this person from an REI perspective? And is the, I, I can't even pronounce the drug that you just mentioned, but like that, uh, that you know of affects the rheumatoid situation, like they wouldn't know that, be, you know, right away unless there's been a bunch of research. But there's just there's only a handful of decades that this has been around, and so it makes it hard to to kind of go back to someone and say, hey, like sorry because we gave you this treatment, now this is affected. Uh, yeah, and fertility. let me say, like, yeah, they may um, infertility new, but a lot of these chemo agents are not new. They've been around and they kind of understand that the yeah. big ones can have effect. Um, so yeah, that's where we're looking at. That's what we need to do. And that's kind of where the advocate comes in. And we have a long way to go because as you can imagine, uh, even if you want to do fertility preservation because you have cancer, doesn't mean that you have coverage for it because there are currently a limited amount of states that are mandated to give coverage. Um, so there's a group called Resolve um, and it's, their website is resolve.org. There's kind of our lobbying institution that goes to the state and they're trying to get all the states to kind of have something in place. So some states will do it only if you have cancer, which is good, and you don't have any infertility coverage otherwise. Some would do both where you have cancer or you just have basic infertility needs. Um, and so we're kind of struggling with that because if you have a diagnosis of cancer, cancer treatment is not cheap either. And then we're telling you about infertility, uh, fertility preservation, and that can cost you $15,000, $20,000 out of the pocket if you don't have coverage. Well, obviously, well, most programs would do like where I am, they're not going to charge you that because it's kind of obvious this is something altruistic. We want to make this something that's necessary. We want to make it affordable. So we try to get your meds. It's cheap. Get them for free, discounted. Um, and you don't full pay like that full price of what it would cost if you don't have coverage. Still, that's still a lot for some patients because I've had a patient here in the state of Illinois and thankfully her oncologist program gave her the money to do her fertility preservation because she was like 22 years old with cancer and she couldn't afford to do this because she was working at a restaurant. She didn't have coverage. Wow. Um, so you hear those stories. And so the, the, the place where we are, obviously, we need more advocates. We need to educate um, the doctors, as you're talking about, who that's not their area. We're trying to get around and talk to the oncologists and talk to the rheumatologists and talk to all those who may be using this that can cause chemotoxic effects to the tissue and kind of have a streamlined program where they get those patients to our doors in a very short amount of time so we can get them back to their cancer treatments or whatever treatment that they need to sustain their lives. Um, so cost is a problem. Making sure education is out there is a problem. And then, of course, not every... Uh, and fertility clinic does offer because, uh, as you might have said, we, we do this, we try to do this for f almost free. Well, we don't make money off of it. And the point is not to make money in this case, but a lot of programs don't see the benefit of it because the studies have shown that some patients who do this haven't come back for their tissue. So you froze mm -hmm. this and you had cancer. My question is, we don't have a database to say they didn't come back because unfortunately they passed away from their cancer. Like, 
it hasn't been a follow up to see why we have such low numbers coming back after they beat their cancers. Yeah. Well, and and I think the you mentioned all the the avenues where there's there's issues and all of the individuals who need to be involved. I think one that you missed there was like health insurance. Somebody needs to talk to these health insurance companies to say you're willing to cover the cancer, but as soon as we bring up the infertility side of things, you're like mm, that's not covered. We're not we're not going to be a part of it. like that. That should almost be baked into yeah. whatever cancer coverage they are going to provide. Uh, that should just become be, become part of the same program. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we got a, a lot of lobbying to do, but at the end of the day, they always want to know who's going to pay for that cut. Mm -hmm. the taxpayers, when, you know, it's not a taxpayer situation right there because insurance is usually private from your employer's benefits. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's a whole nother, we could go on that tangent for another 30 minutes if we wanted to yeah. talking about health insurance companies. We won't do that today, but. Uh, yeah, we will do that can of worms, yes. You bet. Um, in the REI space, you know, what are some of the latest technologies? We were talking about some of the different treatments um, a little bit ago, but what, what are some of the latest technologies in the REI space that that our listeners may not know about? That, that maybe they're listening and they have uh, they have infertility issues and they haven't gone to see someone like you or, you know, they have and, and there's just like, okay, what other options are out there? What are some of the kind of the latest and cutting edge technologies that are out there that people should know about? Um, that actually you can use because things are still in the research pipeline, but always, as far yeah. as like helping with egg quality, patients should always be talking to their doctors about, you know, there are a lot of supplements, but there's things that are non-traditional like inf IV infusions of like glutathione, NAD+. Plus. They can help with egg quality if you are someone who has a diagnosis of diminished ovarian reserve and you're older, that can help with better outcomes. Um, if you have embryos and you've had problems with miscarriage, there's things like intralipid infusions where it helps with the uterine um, growth to make it thicker. There's things like intrauterine nupagen. I'm throwing out a lot of terms that you may not know, but it helps. I'll Google with, these like, later. Don't worry about it. Keep going. <laughs> it's actually called granulocyte colony stimulating factors. So we infuse it into the uterus before, uh, like seven to five days before transfer. And for women who've had a history of poor lining or implantation failures, that helps with that, helps with this carriage reduction. Uh, intrauterine HCG, which is human chorionic gonadotropin, is the pregnancy hormone. Uh, that's kind of optional too, where you can put that into the uterus two uh, to five minutes before embryo transfer. And it studies show that it helps with implantation of the embryo and it reduces miscarriage rates. Why? Well, ACG, your, your uterus thinks you're already pregnant, increases adhesion molecules. And so it kind of turns on the green lights a little faster is kind of the thought behind it. Yeah. Um, when did you say that goes in? That ACG the day of your embryo transfer. The day of your embryo transfer, you, we do it like two to five minutes before we put your embryo into the uterus. Boy, you um, versus with everything green else light. does is done beforehand. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, that's that's quick. It is quick. Uh, you know, during your cycles, like there's so many different protocols. Like, uh, but a lot of times, patients aren't using things like Omnitrope, which is growth hormone. Um, that is off-label use. Is traditionally used in medicine for patients who children who have growth issues and not growing. So we give them growth hormone to help them with their growth spurts. Well, we actually use it in infertility to help with egg quality um, when the IVF cycle is going through. Uh, on the sperm side, we, we talked about male factor. There's things like calcium ionophore to help with fertilization of eggs if the sperm is not able to fertilize it well. Uh, picking healthier sperm, there's something called physiological ICSI where we're looking for this protein called hyaluronidase that those sperm would stick to on a plate. And we use those to actually select and inject into the eggs because they're swimming, they look normal. And we saw that they have that protein that allow them to bind. So those are for when we see that there's male factor, you might have like 20 eggs, but you got all of your embryos arrested or you had them um, not fertilized. That's kind of some of those things that are in the pipe. Well, those are in the pipe. Those are being used right now, but not every clinic does it. Um, I think those are kind of the basics right now. Uh, if someone has an issue where they do, they've done IVF and even though the eggs should have been mature, they were immature. And when I say that a woman, when they start their cycle, all the little baby eggs are little clones of them. I usually say that for lack of a better description for people sure. who are not scientists. The, the lay term for someone like me. Yes. Right. And so as the egg grows, it's half in genetic information is going through maturation. 
And so we assume when we scan any patients that if an egg reaches a follicle reaches a certain size, that should be mature and able to accept sperm. But sometimes we get to there and we get these eggs and we see patients like, oh, you got 20 eggs. They're all immature, you know. How do we overcome that? Well, you can do something called in vitro maturation, which was originally for women who are polycystic ovarian syndrome. But instead, now you can go in, aspirate those eggs, culture them to maturity, and then try to fertilize them with the sperm. That gets you more embryos because we can't use immature eggs. We have to have mature eggs to fertilize. And I know that might sound like uh, Greek to you, so I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> no, you're good. I mean, uh I knew you were very smart uh, before we even started this conversation. So that, I knew that I was going to have a bunch of terms thrown at me that I was not going to know. And even if I go and try and Google them later, I will spell them incorrectly. And uh, oh, no worries. Google the whole point idiot, is but... uh, talk to your doctor. And if you don't like, to, like, they're not giving you some innovative thing, you know, we don't have a cure for everything. But you sure. can always. So my point is, if you get second opinions, it's okay to talk to somebody else and still go back to your original provider. Um, but do try to find out what can be done, if any to help. Yeah. Um, what would you say to those people who, who want to give up too soon? Like, y you know, like there's people who go too long. We talked about that at the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we've, we've gone through way too many cycles. Here's some other options. What do you say to the folks who, um, you know, maybe they had one round of, of immature eggs and, you know, you, you go through one, you try one type of treatment, it didn't work and they just want to give up too soon. What are the, what's that conversation like? Um, well, a good friend, or actually it wasn't a good friend, actually it was a patient that used, used this term. She realized infertility and this treatment is not a marathon, uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. That's the great analogy. Um, some people, yes, depending on your diet, like if you are PCOS, you have a lot of eggs, you can do one cycle and you'll be fine. You only want two kids, you got six embryos. So you mm -hmm. can be done. But there are those who will go through a cycle, multiple cycles, and we're getting embryos, we get eggs, the embryos are either abnormal or they arrest in their development. Um, it will take multiple cycles depending on how many children you want. So, you know, I joked in the beginning saying 30 cycles. Don't do ever do 30 cycles, please. Yeah. Uh, but you very well could do two to four cycles to get the number of children you want. When I say that, like when I counsel patients, how many children do you want? You want four kids. Okay. That means... Based off your very reserve, you only have 10 eggs when I scan you, you know right there it's going to take you multiple rounds for us to get. I want you, if you want four children, I want you to have about 10 to 12 embryos because it's about three children per, three embryos per child that you desire is kind of the odds you want to have in your head because not every time you plant transfer embryo do you get a pregnancy. There's miscarriage. And so that's why statistically three to one is kind of what you want. Sure. And so that conversation kind of goes with explaining this is what your ovarian reserve. This is the family size that you said you want. This is how many embryos you need. Can you do it in one cycle based off of your testing? If you're PCOS, you probably could. If you're not PCOS, then it's probably going to take you more cycles. What does that look like? This should be two to four cycles maybe, um, and then stop. What happens to those patients who are in, you know, older, like in their 40s, and they're still trying? You know, The heart wants what the heart wants. You kind of counsel them and they want to give up at that point when they want to give up this is when i started saying okay we have you have done three to four cycles and you have one normal embryo we transferred you didn't get pregnant you can keep doing this but it's probably going to take you another four to six cycles if you really want to get pregnant the most efficient and fastest way is donor eggs that's when i kind of broached that conversation when they're ready to give up if they're at the right point to like kind of throw it. but i usually always say give love a chance don't give up too soon because it is not by any means a quick and easy process the way people would think it is. Like you think, oh, it's it IVF. I'll get sperm. Voila, I'm pregnant because I have embryos. If you ask any infertility patient, they will never tell you this is easy. And it is not. Physically, financially, emotionally. I think the emotional part is worse than the financial, actually. Because a lot of my patients have depression and anxiety. And it's hard for me to know. I don't know if it was a chicken or the egg. I don't know which came first. Did they have depression, anxiety before her? Or is this a, a result of like dealing with the trauma? Because there is studies that show infertility patients have as much trauma and anxiety as somebody with cancer when they did it. Wow. You can matter cancer, you understand it because like you hear the word and you think you got a death sentence, which may not be the case. Well, patients when they have infertility or dealing with it feel that same kind of trepidation, anxiety as a cancer diagnosis. Hmm. Yeah, that so, totally makes sense. And yeah. chicken and the egg is again another good analogy. I liked your 
it's not a marathon or it is a marathon. It's not a race that great analogy, but chicken and the egg, uh, it, yeah. I, I gotta imagine it's, it's the infertility first, then the depression and anxiety. Um, yeah. but you never know. That's yeah. it's, it's overall, it's just a, a tough situation to be in. Um, those experiences that need, need folks like you out there that, that have their back and you're obviously a great advocate for what you do. Um, you provide a lot of great education. Like we've talked Thank about, you. I can tell you care. You get, you get so excited when you talk about this stuff. Um, and it just, it, it's, it's very well seen and it's known. So well, kudos, you kudos to you for that. I spent all my good years doing this. Now I got infertility, so it better be. <laughs> I froze my eggs because I, I knew I should freeze them. So they're frozen in the freezer in the back. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I, I like to end my show with the same question. Uh, it's a very broad question, so be as specific or as broad as you want to be. But uh, what is next for Dr. Loudon in the next five years? Well, Pinky, or are you the brain? Which one? The plan is to take over the world. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I want to be the brain. It. You want to be the brain? Okay, yeah. I'll be Pinky. We got to take over the world. That's always the plan. Like, um, you know, as far as career rise, you know, I definitely have a lot more to do. But for me, that means I do want to get back into more of research because um, yeah. now I'm in private practice. So private clinics do do research. They don't do as much as they, like if you're an academic center, meaning there are practitioners who work at like University of Chicago, Northwestern, who are REIs. Well, that's considered academics because they're training the next generation of doctors. So they have a lot of research they can do versus private practice. We're not associated with an academic institute. So, you know, not to say we don't care about research, but they tend to be more just focused on like getting treatments. We're not doing research. So I kind of do want to get back. I don't kind of. I will get back into research. It mostly will be clinical. No more mice for me unless I collaborate with somebody in the academic world. That's definitely there. Um, definitely want to grow my footprint in the onco fertility um, setting. Yeah. Um, and so get that, get more patients and be knowledgeable about it and, and, and go for those treatments. Uh, so making better programs, we definitely are a long way from being efficient, for lack of a better word, uh, because there's so many so many problems that haven't been solved that make it a smooth flow, as we kind of talked about. So those are kind of my big three, my big things. And while I'm doing all those things, not to forget about my own fertility. So these eggs are frozen. I need Mr. Wonderful to show up, or I'm gonna have to use a donor sperm, just like my patient. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. I'm getting old. I don't want to be 50 years old having babies. We can't do that. No. Some people want to do that. And no shade to anybody. And none of my patients want to do that. I just don't want to be mistaken for my child's grandma at the graduation. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm hearing uh, research. I'm hearing uh, grow the onco fertility space and find you a man. That's what I'm hearing. Find Mr. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> why? That's uh, why being financially savvy? Because you know that's where I need I need you at. <laughs> that's absolutely. I can I can do that part. I'm I'm not the man. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, to do the uh -huh. other stuff. You have I'll, a lovely wife. We're good. <laughs> you bet. Yep. Thank you. Well, you uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. I knew I was going to as soon as we got this scheduled. So uh, I'm glad you you took some time out of your your day to to hang out with me, and I look forward to when our paths cross here in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was fun.